Hello again, um, it's Mona Higgins. Um, I'd like to chat to you a little bit about this latest um, novel that's just about to be released. Uh, it's about to be published. It's uh, my first attempt at um, sci-fi horror. So uh, I really, really enjoyed writing this book. I love the characters in it and as a result it has now grown into three books. So this is the first one in the series and what I'd like to do is read to you um the first I'd like to read to you the full first chapter it is um quite long um so please bear with me but I really hope you enjoy it and what I might do is take a little break uh, midway just to give you guys a chance to pause but it is such a good good book lots of twists lots of turns don't expect it you you'll be taken by surprise so let's have a wee listen Okay guys, here we go. The pressure relay sizzled and sparked, fizzing angrily in its housing. Son of a bitch! David Bockerat, line engineer, gritted his teeth as he disconnected the power and prized the faulty unit out. Sitting back on his heels, David scanned the issue number and date, comparing readings on his repairs and replacement database. <sighs> Sighing to himself, he checked the readouts on his pad. You've got to be kidding. The relay had been replaced last turnaround and was supposed to last at least 30 years. He opened his spare case and selected a new relay, double checking it wasn't from the same batch. Once he was sure that the new relay was working, he closed the unit and slowly stood up, wincing slightly as the blood brushed back into his legs. David's body was starting to show wear and tear from the years of crouching and crawling into tight and difficult spaces aboard the interstellar spaceships. He stretched and spoke out loud, Joe. David flicked a switch and reconnected the power. Joe. Yes, David. The calm mechanical tones of the ship's computer responded to his summons. Closing the hatch in the wall, David tried not to sound irritable and slipped his multi-tool back into his belt, belt latch. Joe, I want you to issue a report that the last batch of Z20 pressure trips may be faulty. This one was replaced last year and it's just melted the shit over the housing. Get the line to check all the ships issued with this batch of replacements. Melted shit. David sighed again. This was beginning to annoy him. Yeah, he was almost a year into this voyage and he still hadn't located the personality programme for the AI computer. David was a replacement engineer for Robert Wallen, the oldest engineer in the fleet, who had sadly passed away suddenly at home port just before he took this his last voyage before retirement. David was also a lifetime company man, having been in engineering since he qualified a good 30 years ago. It took a special personality to work these interstellar cruisers, and one of the main perks was getting to interact with the AI computers that did the bulk of the maintenance and essentially were the soul of the ship. They were all given distinct and varied personality programmes to make them as human as possible, and they were usually great company. David had been totally surprised to find this ship was running on the basic factory settings and the personality programme had been shut down. Try as he might, he simply couldn't understand where the last engineer had stored it or why he had switched it off in the first place. Taking a deep breath, he organised his thoughts. It was really difficult working with a unit that was only acting on basic settings. They were very literal and personally, he liked to build a rapport with the computers flying the ships he was working on. Sorry, it has overheated and melted silicon residue over the relay housing. I have replaced it, so hopefully it won't happen again. Joe 90 confirming instructions and executing. David tried not to laugh. All of the ships in this ferry line were of the Juggernaut class and the ship's computers were named after that. The Juggernaut Online Evaluation Systems. They were all AIs, and as this ship was number 90 in the fleet, the computer was called Joe 90. When David had heard about Robert's sudden death, he had deliberately asked for this posting. He had wanted to be the engineer on this ship for years, but Robert was adamant he would never budge or try another cruiser. The other engineers would joke amongst themselves, saying her position on this ship was literally dead man's shoes. <laughs> they didn't realise how right they were. The reason David so wanted to be on this particular ship was just because of the computer name. 
As a hobby, he would watch ancient recordings of TV shows from several hundred years ago, and he loved ancient history and was particularly fond of shows with puppets. David's speciality was not just in practical engineering of nuts and bolts work, but he was adept at advanced programming and computer systems maintenance. And one of the shows he especially liked was the Jerry Anderson's children's shows that used puppets. David liked to think that these puppets were the first robots and the advanced models on the Jerry Anderson programme made them almost seem like AIs. He liked them all, but his particular favourite was a character called Joe 90, who had special powers. He made his way back to his engineering control centre, taking a route that took him to the stasis deck, where he checked in on the rest of the crew and passengers in the stasis chambers. They were 11 months into a two and a half year trip to the colony planet Echo One, a well-known holiday destination. Now, although the AIs essentially ran the ship, it was required by the company that at least one crew member remained awake during the flight. It was quite a commitment for a single human to remain alone for this length of time, and it took a special personality to be able to cope with the tedium and boredom. That was one of the main reasons for developing personality programs for the computers. It took away the loneliness and each engineer was carefully psychologically profiled to ensure that they would get along with the AI. Despite the years virtually on his own, David loved his job. He had made this run at least 30 times on ships 70, 87, 15 and 63, ferrying his passengers safely to their holiday destinations and back. He was beginning to feel the mileage and as he felt himself getting close to retirement age, he was beginning to understand how Robert must have felt. David wasn't sure if he wanted to settle down planet side and if he did, would it be on the leisure planet or on Earth? Because of the technical requirements of his job, he'd been very well paid over the years and had a tidy sum saved up, enough that he could live out the rest of his life in luxury. The problem was he just loved space. Every time he had made the trip as engineer, conscious crew member in charge, he would ponder on what he would do when he retired. David was sociable, but he also liked his own company and would not be able to cope in a crowded planet, even if it was a leisure planet. Too many people might just freak him out. There were occasions that he missed company, and so, if he got bored, he would chat to the Joes on the ships or activate the holograph room and visit his favourite bar. The other Joes in the fleet had been great company and he had become good friends with them all, especially Joe 6 to D and Joe 15, having done at least two runs with each. This was the first time that the ship did not have the personal prog- personality programme activated and it was set to default and, as far as he was concerned, very boring factory communication limits. Throwing his notepad down on the desk, he sat at the console, the blank screen reflecting his face. David frowned. He really would need to shave. Hmm. He rubbed at the stubble and grimaced, debating whether or not he should grow a beard. Sighing, he tapped in his ID code and began his standard sweep of ship's systems. It was several hours later when he finished and everything seemed to be fine. Activate the holodeck, Joe. I am done for the day. He listened to the automatic neutral response from the computer and shook his head. He was really going to have to find that programme. Music hummed away in the background as David stepped into the holograph room. He had spent a long time developing this programme and had faithfully recreated the perfect bar with characters he had known in some form or another during his life. He had stored the whole programme on his personal disc, which he took from ship to ship, and, over the years, he had seen the characters develop and grow. David was very, very good with code and had written into his hollow characters the ability to learn and adapt. This made for a much more entertaining rapport. For 30 years, this bar had been his go-to place on every ship and he loved it. The usual suspects were there. Dorothy, the barmaid, middle-aged with curly blonde hair, cut in a short bob. She had four arms any sailor would be proud of and a punch you did not want to experience. She was someone you would never tangle with or you would end up with a fat lip and a sore head. But inside, she was a real mum to everyone. Someone who would listen to all your woes and give you advice. He had known the real Dorothy once, long ago, when he was young and he, she was old then. She was still the go-to person for almost all the students at Company Engineering Campus. A counsellor, a confidant, a disciplinarian, a straight talker and an absolute angel of a woman. David smiled as he remembered her. 
A smile that faded quickly as a wave of sadness washed over him. As he stood there and watched her rosy face laughing with the clients, he suddenly realised she was probably long gone and this was all that remained of her. His memories locked in a computer simulation. Then there was Mad Mikey, <laughs> a dodgy character known for starting spontaneous bar fights, but who was a natural comedian that entertained anyone who chose to listen. Mikey was the epitome of an ageing rocker. His slick backed greying hair, the weather beaten face from riding his Harley, the scuffed leather jacket and a grin that showed teeth like an old piano keyboard, yellow with some missing. The real Mikey had often led a young but old enough to know better David into many a mad cap and potentially dangerous situation and they always managed to survive though despite the odds and would often recover in the pub and laugh at their near misses. David had been there when Mikey finally ran out of luck. He remembered him flying past him on his ancient Harley, laughing wildly as he sped past David on his highly safe computer controlled by unit with safety bubble automatically engaged. David had been laughing at him and his voice choked in his throat as he saw the Harley tip too much to the left, the solid footrest scraping up along the ground, sending sparks showering backwards. Mikey had opted for a bailout and dropped the bike, hoping he would skid along for a bit, then pick himself up as he usually did. Unfortunately for him, he did skid, right under the wheels of a passing transporter, the auto control unable to avoid him. David closed his eyes at the memory and shut it from his mind. No. This was how he would always remember Mikey, standing at the bar, having a laugh. Then there was old Sam, sitting in his corner booth, sipping on his endless pint of ale, pale ale, his cloth cap at a jaunty angle and his cheeks rosy with alcohol. David loved that old man. The real Sam had been a regular at his local pub in the village he had grown up in. David had been given special privileges in that pub. Despite him being a child, he was allowed to sit in the pub and sip ginger beer whilst his father chatted with his friends at the bar. David's father had been an agricultural engineer that worked on AI units in the vast grain fields surrounding the small village. David would look at old Sam in awe, a relic from a bygone age, as he was one of the last of the farmers that had actually worked livestock. Sam would indulge the child let him come and pat his faithful old dog, Jip, that was always lying at his feet. David would listen in trance to Sam, told him stories about the ranging hillside. He would wander in all weathers, tending his animals. Jip, as always, scouting ahead and darting where he was needed. They were both very old when David knew them, Sam having a lung condition that made his voice thin and reedy. Chip seemed ancient, his eyes bright but his joints stiff. He would lie under the table watching the goings on in the bar and hoping someone would top up his saucer at his side with a little lager. When David had left the village to begin training in City 17 educational compound, he had stopped to say goodbye to Sam. In a rare gesture of affection, the old man had hugged him and slipped him something into his hand. Here, lad, he had said, they keep this on you, then you'll never get lost. David had looked in awe at an ancient and battered compass lying in his hand. That there has been with me all my life. Reckon it's yours now, lad. David had shed a tear and hugged him again. Jip had struggled to his feet and gently licked his hand. David kissed the old dog in the head and sadly waved him farewell. It was a few days later that he heard Sam had passed away in that very corner seat. Jip lying dead at his feet, following his master to the very end. <sighs> David still had that compass. He looked at the bar and there were Ron and Roddy, <laughs> the Bailman twins, leaning close to each other and discussing the latest conquest. They were friends from his campus days and a right pair of Jack the lads. They never seemed to study. They were always partying and had a different girl in their arms almost every week. Somehow, though, they had passed their exams and qualified as security unit engineers. <laughs> David hadn't seen them for nearly 20 years. In fact, he had bumped into Ron one day while he was on leave Earthside. Ron was married and so was Roddy, and they were both high up in respectable firms and had become domesticated. Roddy had two kids and Ron was expecting their first. <laughs> David had congratulated him and they went their separate ways, leaving David with a feeling of having missed out on something. 
The nature of his job meant that serious relationships were not possible. David had been a bachelor all of his life and never having found the right woman to settle down with. In the corner sat the girls. David felt his heart melt just a little. Oh, what a gang they had been. It was his last year of study and he was stationed near a massive cruiser construction site. The delicate and difficult job of assembling the core processors for the systems on these ships were usually handled by the women. Their hands were smaller and more sensitive for the delicate parts of this, and this group were the A-team. Jeanette, Sadie, Mags and Babs were in the local every single night after work, sharing gossip and preparing for who knew what in the evenings. Jeanette was the oldest. She was the manager of a whole section and the others would follow her lead. Sadie. Ah, now sweet Sadie. David remembered her very fondly. If he had ever chosen to settle down, it would have been with her. They were an item on and off for a full year he was studying and it was touch and go if he would go into, stellar, into the interstellar position he was offered or settle down port side with Sadie. They had argued that night when he'd had to make the final decision. She had cried and so had he, neither one wanting to say it was over. It had been Mags, sensible, wise Mags that had intervened. She was an expert counsellor. It was his jo her job to check the mental processes of the AI units and she could apply her skills to humans as well. It was her that had smoothed things out, made them both realise that David was always going to be a free spirit destined to roam the stars. And Sadie loved him and David loved her, but he loved the draw of the interstellar ships more. They had parted amicably, agreeing that David would do one run and when he returned after five years, they would decide if they should stay together. David had struggled long and hard with himself during that trip, beginning to design the pub programme to take his mind off of things. When he returned, the decision had been taken out of his hands. Sadie had been killed in an explosion at the factory, as had Babs, bubbly, madcap Babs, her faithful sidekick. David knew that his life now lay in the stars, but he wrote the girls from the Chipping Line factory into the programme as a memorial to them all. They sat, as always, giggling away at some shared joke and sharing stories. Finally, there was Henry. He sat in a booth reading a small leather-bound book. His jacket was once an expensive tweed, but now it was worn at the elbows and slightly tatty. He always had a shirt and tie, the collar slightly frayed. His hair was grey and neatly combed back, a thin pencil-line moustache wiggling across his top lip as he pursed his mouth at something interesting in his book. Henry had been well-to-do at some point in his life, but had obviously fallen on hard times. Still striving to keep smart in his worn-out clothing, he wore his dignity like a majestic robe. He quietly sipped a brandy, savouring every mouthful, his eyes a distant as he mulled over some of life's great mysteries. Henry had been a philosophy professor at City 17 Higher Training Centre. Having showed exceptional intelligence and great promise, David had been advanced to computer programming and AI development. One of the core subjects for all AI engineers, besides psychology, was philosophy, and David loved it. He had spent many hours in Henry's classes pondering life's mysteries. David had only socialised with Henry a few times as part of a favoured group, and Henry always reminded him of a wise old sage carefully coaching his students into independent and radical thought. When David graduated and moved to campus, it was with great sadness that he learned of Henry's tragic death, just a few months after he had moved. It all seemed very strange and was labelled accidental, but rumours ran amok, as rumours tend to do, and the word was he had committed suicide, and City 17 had tried to cover it up as lest it affect their student intake. David had recreated Henry as he remembered him best from those days he had gave over to his chosen group of students. He loved to spend time with his hologram of Henry. He had created his programme to be as fluid as possible with an almost endless catalogue of philosophical musings that he could debate and discuss. Hi, love, Dorothy waved as he walked into the bar. What's it today? David smiled and sat down next to Ron. Guinness, please, Dorothy. Hi, Ron. Up to no good again, eh? Ron winked at him and saluted with his glass, spilling some heavy onto the bar. Hey, watch what you're doing, Dorothy scowled at Ron as she handed a pint to David. I've just cleaned that, you little twat. David laughed and made a hasty exit towards Henry, who had raised an eyebrow at the commotion. Mind if I join you, Henry? He sat down, not waiting for an answer. By all means, good man, by all means. Henry smiled softly and sipped his brandy. Looks like you've had a hard day, he said. 
Davy swallowed a quarter of his pint, watching Henry over the rim. It never ceased to amaze him how the drinks tasted so real, but without the negative effects of alcohol. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. What makes you say that, Henry? Ah, you always drink Guinness when you've had a hard day at work. Do I? Yes, I have observed, Henry put his glass and assumed a look that a poet might get when inspiration flowed into his mind. Lager when you're feeling frisky, he winked solemnly. Heavy when you're down and pale ale when you're upbeat and ready for action. David smiled broadly. Well, I never. He was secretly pleased. This was the first time he'd seen this hologram make abstract comments that were not pre-programmed. You've been doing some deep thinking and observation. Henry bowed his head in acknowledgement. I aim to please, David. I aim to please. David took another swallow of his pint and sighed. It's these stupid breakdowns and systems failures. I just can't make head nor tail of it. We're almost a year into this voyage and right from the start I've been bothered with stupid faults. And the weird thing is most of the things that are breaking down have been replaced recently or are well within safety parameters. It doesn't make any sense. I even double checked the batch numbers and year of manufacture and yep, it's correct. At first I thought it was following some route but I have mapped it out and there's just no pattern. Crazy. What does Joe say about it? David snorted. <laughs> Joe is as efficient as a fridge. Not not following you, old man. He's on basic factory settings. Personality programme was switched off by the last engineer. Really? That is interesting. Henry looked sadly at his now empty glass. Another one, Henry? Well, well, that's very decent of you, old man. Yes, I think I will. David started towards the bar. Gremlins, old Sam's soft, reedy voice whispered from the corner. W what? David knew that Sam's programme was almost as advanced as Henry, so if he chose to say anything, it was worth listening to. Gremlins, the old man repeated. Gremlins? Yes, that's what we used to call them, gremlins. Always up to no good, breaking things, causing no end of trouble. Tricky to get rid of his gremlins. David nodded, not sure of what to say. He continued to the bar and got a brandy for Henry and a half lager for Jip. As he made his way back to Henry, he stopped and poured the lager into Jip's dish. There you go, old boy, that's what you needed, isn't it? The old dog's tail thumped softly on the floor in happiness as he lapped up his golden treat. Thank you kindly, David. Sam smiled, a thin lip smile. And all Jip says thank you as well. David nodded as he turned to go. Watch out for them gremlins, these tricky things. Reckon you might need Joe's help on this one. Don't think Joe's up to much. No personality. <laughs> David tried not to laugh as he realised Sam was serious. Well, seems to me that you might need to find his personality, eh? Sam put his pipe to his lips and David knew that was the end of the conversation. Interesting. Henry took the brandy and gently cupped the glass, swirling the contents and admiring the scent. Uh, sorry, David wasn't sure what Henry was referring to. Do you mean what old Sam said? Hmm? You know, the gremlin thing. Henry sipped his brandy and quizzically looked at David. Of course not, old boy. I mean, it's interesting that you cannot locate Joe's personality programme. David nodded and sat back, absentmindedly flicking a crumb off the table. I mean, from what you've told me, you seem to have searched all of the usual places. It's almost as if someone deliberately hid it. Henry laughed at his own words, not noticing David staring at him. Why would an engineer do that? He asked, a strange chill creeping up his back. I mean, these voyages are long and can be tedious. He'd never heard of any engineer turning off a programme, let alone hiding one. Robert was on this ship almost all of his life. He must have known every single nut and bolt that sort of familiarity could simply breed complacency, and that is where the AIs came to their fore. They kept the engineer on the straight and narrow, another mind to converse with and discuss things. Why would he spend it with a basic AI system that could not realistically think independently, but simply reported automatically? Don't be silly, old man. I was just joking. Let's be honest. You really haven't had much time to search for the programme, what with all these breakdowns. It's probably been stored in a remote back file somewhere, stupid. These things happen. Yeah, right. These things happen. Mm -hmm. David finished his pint deep in thought. 
He couldn't even ask Joe to search for the file. AIs were not permitted to access or activate the personality program. Only an engineer could do that. So Joe simply would not be able to see it. What you need to ask yourself, old boy, is this. Where would I hide something that would not be, could not be deleted, but maybe I didn't want to be found? Henry drained his glass and put it down on the table, staring at David with an intensity he had not seen before. Uh, well, David stared back. I, I might save it to a manual backup drive for basic systems. Like, prompted Henry. Like, uh, auto cleaning for sub decks and bulkheads. Well, there you are then. It's a starting place at least. There was a hubbub of laughter and giggling from the girls' corner as they stood up and got their coats on. That you lot off now, Dorothy shouted over the noise of the music and conversation, drying a glass with a towel that could have been a biohazard. Yes, Dot, see you tomorrow, Jeanette nodded and the ladies departed into the darkness of simulated night. David often wondered what happened when the holograms left the running programme. Did they just switch off, cease to exist till they were needed again? He felt a strange sadness at that thought. These people were his friends. He had known their real versions and their hollow programmes most of their life and he felt they felt more real than the faceless passengers endlessly boarding and disembarking. There are stranger things in heaven and earth, Henry quoted, almost reading his mind. What? The lost programme, old boy, the lost programme. Oh, yeah, right. Ugh. David stood up. That's me done for the day, Henry. I'll let you know how I get on with the mystery search. You do that, old boy. You do that. Henry saluted him with his glass as he walked out of the door, the programme automatically ending. David made his way back to his quarters, strolling casually down the corridor and mulling over what had been the strangest conversation he had ever had in that bar. He automatically glanced at the system panels on his way, looking for any hint of trouble. Joe? Yes, David. I'm going to bed now. Can you run a system scan and let me know if any issues when I wake? Yes, David. Joe 90 will carry out a systems check. This time David did smile and the theme tune of the old Joe 90 series ran in his head as he reached his quarters. The door slid shut behind him and he breathed a sigh of contentment. He never had been one for collecting junk over the years, but there were one or two things that were his prized possessions and they travelled with him everywhere he went. The pride of place was a replica of the original Joe 90 puppet, complete with his own stand. He had a couple of others, Captain Scarlet and Angel One, but Joe was his all-time favourite and he stood on the ledge of the viewing window, the darkness of space, beyond highlighting the colours of his outfit that the spotlight picked out. There were a few technical manuals dotted around here and there, his own throw blanket for the seating area and a large screen viewer that he had programmed all of his favourite shows into. David knew most of them by heart, but he enjoyed watching them again from time to time. Stretching and yawning, he decided to call it a night and went into his bedroom, undressing and throwing his workwear into the cleaning unit for the morning. The side light on his bedside table automatically came on and a small metallic gleam drew his eye. Still finding my way, Sam, he said quietly as he gently touched the compass, its needles spinning slowly, searching for north. Climbing into bed, he lay down. Lights out. Sorry guys, totally forgot to take a break there. I just, that's a, if you've made it to the end of that, well done you. <laughs> Full marks to you. Hope you enjoyed it. It gets very creepy with lots of uh, plot twists that you would not expect. Now, The Engineer is due to be uh, released uh, later this year. It's at Publishers at the moment. So as soon as it's out, we will let you know and you can buy it from all major online retail stores. <laughs> well, listen, I hope to see you soon um, for another reading for some of the other books and I hope you enjoy them. You take care and have a good day.